before uh, it gets to the full committee. Because these extra hours would not count for overtime, managers would not have a financial incentive to limit the number of hours worked in a week. It is important that appropriate checks are in place, whether in statute or in agency procedures, to ensure that federal firefighters do not work an unsafe number of hours in a particular week, given the stresses of the types of situations that they're working on. Although I have some reservations, I support the legislation at the time, and I yield back uh, the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, would any other members like to be heard on this matter? The chair recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes on HR 3243. Uh, this is very common sense legislation, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you bringing it forward. I, I must say that uh, um, I ought to speak up on it. My great grandfather into the D.C. Fire Department in 1902, uh, so I feel uh, an affinity to firefighters. Um, I know this much about them, that their schedules are very different and very chaotic. And I think anything we can do, given these brave men and women, to regularize their lives is all to the better. And certainly this unintended consequence of, of triggering overtime is easily dealt with in the manner in which you have, have done. And so I very much support the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. If no other members wish to be heard, I now call up H.R. 3243. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 3243, a bill to amend Section 5542 of Title V, United States Code, to provide that any hours worked by federal firefighters under the qualified trade of time arrangement shall be excluded for purposes of determinations relating to overtime pay. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. Are there any amendments to the underlying bill? The clerk will. Well, I ask unanimous consent. What do we say? Do we have any amendments? No. Okay. There being no amendments. There being no amendments, I now move that the Subcommittee of, on the Federal Workforce Postal Service in the District of Columbia report H.R. 3243 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with a recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 3243 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to and H.R. 3243 is ordered reported to the Government on the, excuse me, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. The next measure up for consideration is H.R. 3264, the Federal Internship Improvement Act. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Congressman Jerry Conley for the work he's done on this issue, and I'd also like to recognize Congressman Brian Bilbray from California uh, for his role with this legislation as well. H.R. 3264, the Federal Internship Improvement Act, would centralize the federal government's various internship programs, of which there are many, by having each agency designate an internship coordinator and to publicly list the person's contact information. Most importantly, agencies' internship programs would be publicized on the Internet, including any, any associated application procedures and deadlines. At a time of high unemployment, particularly among young people, the federal government should do all it can to make students, parents, and educators aware of available internship programs and opportunities. Under this bill, the Office of Personnel Management would be directed to establish a centralized electronic database for all individuals who have completed a federal internship program and who are also seeking full-time federal employment. This is a good bill, and I hope that the members of the subcommittee will join me in supporting it. I will now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, for any comments he may have on H.R. 3264. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, H.R. 3264 is intended to overhaul the federal internship program. It would require each agency to appoint an intern coordinator, internship coordinator, post internship information online, create a central intern database, require annual reports from agencies on inter internship programs, and authorize agencies to make non-competitive appointments of individuals who have completed an internship program. 
Although it is essential to the proper function of the federal government that we recruit st skilled individuals, it appears that the federal government is not having any trouble recruiting. Since President Obama took office in January 2009, excluding the U.S. Postal Service and temporary hire at the Census Bureau, the civilian workforce has grown by over 105,000 people, employees. The apparent ease in, in federal recruitment is not surprising as the average private sector employee earns just over $59,000 while the average federal employee earns in excess of $119,000. Further, as the federal government layoff rate in May of 2010 was less than half of 1%, it can be assured that the employees hired by the federal government through existing recruitment programs have the appropriate skills to perform the appropriate functions. Without an apparent need, the problem and cost of this program are amplified. Veterans' preference ensures that brave men and women that serve the nation and give, and give the opportunity to continue to serve the nation as civilian workforce. These individuals have acquired many skills during their time in the military that ensure a functional and productive federal government. Depriving veterans of the opportunity to compete for federal jobs through a non-competitive appointment is a loss to the country and should not be supported by this Congress. Finally, although the cost provided providing this information on the Internet and producing an annual reports has not been ca calculated, assuming an internship coordinator is paid the same as an average federal employee, this bill with costs would cost each agency that runs an internship program on the average of $119,982.29 annually. Or assuming internship coordinators are limited to the 15 major federal departments, Department of Education, Department of Labor, etc., this bill would cost nearly $1.8 million annually just to administer. Without a clear need for this reform and in light of the costs and negative effects that this bill have on our veterans, I cannot support this bill and urge my colleagues to join me in opposition of this bill. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Do any other members wish to be heard on this? The chair sure. recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, only to say that I strongly support this measure. I have no further comments. I thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for five on minutes. Bill, on, on the uh, bill, I just, uh, just listened to what my colleague from uh, Utah said. I, um, you know, I've often said, Mr. Chairman, that uh, our children are the living messages we send to a future we will never see. And internships uh, are very, very important. Um, and creating those mechanisms which will foster uh, strong internships are very important. We're in a tough economic time right now, but we all of us know on this committee that we've got a lot of people uh, on the verge of retiring or retiring. Uh, Ms. Norton talks about this quite often, and um, we've got to make sure that we replace the troops or we're going to be in big trouble. And it's good to know that we, we set up the mechanism by which people can come in, be prepared to do a good job. I mean, I'm just sitting here looking at these folks right here. I mean, we, we've got to have uh, these kinds of programs to make, to make sure that we have effective and efficient uh, training grounds for our young people so that they can, can carry on. And so I, I, I heard what the gentleman from Utah has said, but um, the ranking member, um, but uh, I'm sure that uh, he got here through some type of mentorship. Somebody mentored you, even if it was just your mother and father. Um, and, and so we've got to, to do that. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, who is the driving force behind this bill. Thank you. Um, I, thank, uh, I thank my good friend from Massachusetts, and I want to commend and thank uh, the gentleman from Maryland for adding the enactment uh, uh, clauses. Uh, uh, very good catch, and I think very important as we move forward. Um, I, I continue to believe that uh, trying to regularize student inter internships so that we use them as a, a tool for recruiting and retention uh, in the workforce is just vital moving forward. When you compare the private sector record to the public sector record, it is almost scandalous. In the private sector, almost 50 percent of such internships lead to actual recruitment of somebody for that future workforce. In the federal government, the comparable percentage is less than 7 percent. And uh, that tells me something is badly broken. Um, I would say to my good friend from Utah that I don't know where he gets his cost estimate, 
But the CBO cost estimate for uh, the, the Armed Services Committee, where we hope to add this bill today to the NDA, is that it has zero cost. Uh, and I would also point out to him that uh, I instituted, as the chairman of one of the largest counties in the United States, a, a very vigorous telework program in Fairfax County. And uh, we were able to do it at virtually no cost. We didn't have to hire lots of new people. We actually gave the assignment to existing people and had this be part of their portfolio. Uh, and it worked great. We, we met our goals and then some. Our goal was to have 20 percent of the eligible workforce telecommuting by 2005. Uh, we exceeded that goal and have exceeded it in every subsequent year at, uh, at virtually no cost. As a matter of fact, uh, just integrated into the ongoing operations um, of the enterprise. So uh, I don't think the issue of telework is a cost issue. Um, I think it's a question of whether we've got the political will and the will to marshal uh, the, uh, the attributes of technology uh, to uh, better uh, the quality of the workforce. Uh, to compete with the private sector as we move forward, uh, to recognize that we've got a real serious challenge as the baby boom generation uh, uh, moves its way through toward retirement. Uh, there will be a very substantial number of people in the federal workforce, over 40 percent, who will in fact be eligible for retirement over the next 10 to 12 years. We've got to replace a lot of those folks, uh, and that means we're uh, recruiting from a, the younger generation that has certain expectations about the uh, offerings in the workplace, flexibility in the workplace, and the fact that we're technology smart. Uh, we know that, uh, that uh, telework has the uh, enormous advantages uh, as a national security uh, issue in being able to have continuity of operations uh, in the federal government. We saw it recently. Um, uh, we saw it recently uh, in terms of uh, uh, the use of uh, technology for, uh, for the federal government. With respect to inter in internship, going back to internship and, and the use of technology, uh, while I was talking about telework, um, we, uh, we want to make sure that those tools are in place and that use of technology, whether it be telework um, or, uh, in fact, a smarter internship uh, for uh, recruiting our workforce, uh, is in place. And so uh, I believe that a regularized internship can make a big difference, as can telework. Um, and I would hope we would adopt what I think is really a modest proposal to try to systematize the use of internship and get better results for the federal but government. Will the gentleman yield here? At the I certainly will. Uh, I applaud the work and the, the commitment that you have to this. Uh, there are a lot of very good provisions in this, and, and, I, and I applaud you for that. One of the fundamental challenges that, that, that I have, one of the, the, the sticking points for me, one of the things I don't like, is that the idea is that we would prioritize taking an intern and putting him right into a job of up and beyond a veteran who I would argue has done a lot more and deserves a lot more preference above and beyond everybody else. Reclaiming, I want that reclaiming, person to jump, a, reclaiming my jump time. to the top of the Reclaiming top of the my time. Uh, my dear friend is confusing two different internships. I'm talking about student internships where we're talking about entry-level positions to try to recruit people into the federal workforce. You're talking about a different program, and I share your concerns about that program. And indeed, that's why we were so careful, Mr. Bilbray and myself, in drafting this bill to separate this from the more troubled program. And Ms. Norton, in fact, at the hearing, uh, very uh, uh, de uh, deftly uh, helped uh, highlight some of the problems with that, prob uh, that program. So I, I agree with my friend from Utah that uh, we don't want to see internships used as a way to circumvent the normal hiring process or to, in fact, preclude competition for these valuable positions. The student internship program that we're addressing here today is a very different matter. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I, I just want to amplify one point, and that is this. In our investigations of the student uh, internship program that's in effect right now, we have seen agencies use this uh, in what I think is an abusive way. They have uh, allowed the entire uh, hiring process for certain agencies to go completely around uh, veterans' preference by using what is in place now, what this bill would correct. So by, by requiring that, look, we've seen agencies bring people in through the student internship program where the intern wasn't a student and wasn't enrolled in anything. And they used this program as an end around to go around veterans' preference. 
So what this bill will do, uh, thanks to Mr. Bill Bray and Mr. Connolly, will require that there be a, uh, an attachment to a, uh, a bona fide certified inst educational institution that the person has to be either a full-time or a part-time student. So that will stop these agencies from going around the veteran's preference and, and have to hire those people who are actually uh, enrolled in an educational program. So it will stop the abuse of going around veterans with respect to the, the student program. Then we have to address the wider uh, non-student uh, internship program, and I think we can do that as well so that uh, veterans have that full opportunity. Uh, we, look, we've got probably a quarter of a million uh, uh, men and women in uniform in Iraq and Afghanistan right now. We've probably got uh, probably two and a half million that have served uh, in the Gulf uh, region in recent years. So we have to make sure that we provide opportunities. Uh, I'm distressed to hear that the unemployment numbers for returning veterans is much, much, much higher than the national average. So we need to redouble our efforts to make sure that these opportunities go to veterans as well. And I think that this bill is, is a step in the right direction on, on that regard. Uh, do any other members wish to speak on this bill? If no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 3264. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 3264, a bill to improve federal internship programs and to facilitate hiring of full-time federal employees and for other purposes. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. Uh, Madam Clerk, I believe I have a manager's amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3264 offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia and Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read without objection. The amendment is considered as read. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as original text, and I recognize myself for five minutes. The substitute amendment that Mr. Connolly, Mr. Cummings, and I are jointly offering to the base bill today would strike out the non-competitive hiring authority language in the bill. This is the language that a number of members uh, this afternoon have mentioned that would circumvent, uh, in many instances, uh, veterans' preferences. Uh, the, this amendment uh, would instead require utilization of the existing student educational employment program, which is comprised of both the student temporary employment program and the student career experience program. This program provides students with federal employment opportunities if they are degree-seeking students in academic, technical, or vocational programs at accredited institutions. Additionally, at Mr. Cummings' urging, the amendment would specifically give agencies six months to designate a member of the staff as an intern coordinator and the Office of Personnel Management nine months to implement the act. I hope all members will join us in supporting this amendment, and I now yield to the ranking member for five minutes for any comments he may have on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I appreciate the work that's gone on to this. What I would like to do is ask unanimous consent to insert my previously prepared comments into the record. Without objection. And, and, and simply say, on the one hand, uh, you say that it, it, it helps solve the issue with veterans. We're not necessarily convinced of that yet. I would hope that between now and, and the time it comes to the full committee that we can work out those differences. I believe the gentleman is, is uh, uh, very convinced of this. I think his, his heart's in the right place. I don't uh, dispute any of the motivations. I'd like to simply understand and make sure that the staff also understands where there might be any differences. And so with that, I, I, I just want to simply say, if we can work that out bef be between, then I think we'll help alleviate the, the overwhelming majority of concerns. I don't want to belabor the point in, uh, with all the members here, uh, but just hope that we can work that out. I don't want to do a he said, she said thing type things, but that, that's where, where our heart is on this. And uh, with that, I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. Do any other members wish to be heard on this? Chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. Chairman. I, I just want to uh, uh, thank you for your leadership and that of uh, Mr. Cummings uh, and our colleagues on the committee, Mr. Bill Bray, who's not here. And to reassure our colleague from Utah, I, I think we're in violent agreement. I, I don't think there's going to be any uh, daylight between us. Uh, and, and if there is an issue involving veterans, 
after we've addressed the language the way it is here, by all means, we will try to address it. Uh, and likewise, any cost issues you may have. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland for five minutes. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Very much, Mr. Chairman. I won't take that long. Um, I want to thank uh, you and certainly Representative Connolly for uh, letting me join in on this uh, amendment. I also thank you for including a provision that I suggested that requires federal agencies to appoint their internship coordinators within six months in the Office of Personnel Management to establish this clearinghouse within nine months of enactment of the legislation. Uh, the reason why we did this, uh, Mr. Chairman, is we are d addressing the urgency of now. We know people will, uh, may, not intentionally, but uh, we could go on and on, and these things may not get done in a timely fashion. I just think that putting some type of time limitations uh, and requirements in the, in the uh, bill uh, will assure that it moves along at the speed so that uh, it can uh, be as effective and efficient as we would like for it to be. And with that, uh, again, I thank, thank you and Mr. Connolly. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I, and I thank him for his improvements to the bill. Uh, if no other members wish to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the Lynch Amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. I now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and District of Columbia Report H.R. 3264 is amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 3264 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All of those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to, and H.R. 3264, as amended, is ordered reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Up next for consideration is H.R. 5367, the District of Columbia Courts and Public Defender Service Act of 2010. The bill before us was introduced by our colleague, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton of the District of Columbia on May 24th and is intended to make a number of administrative and legislative changes to enhance the operations of the D.C. Courts and the Public Defender Service of the District of Columbia. As many of you are aware, with the adoption of the National Capital Revitalization and Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997, also known as the Revitalization Act, the federal government assumed budgetary and legislative responsibility for a handful of District of Columbia criminal justice-related entities, such as the D.C. Courts, the Public Defender Service, and the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, also known as CSOSA. Since the Revitalization Act grants to Congress the exclusive authority to amend Title 11 of the D.C. Code pertaining to the D.C. Courts and related agencies, Congresswoman Norton, at the request of the D.C. Courts and the Public Defender Service, has put forth H.R. 5367, which makes several important and cost-saving modifications to the courts and public defender services existing authorities. As it relates to the courts, H.R. 5367 would grant the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals the discretion to hold the statutorily required judicial conference biennially or annually and require local magistrate judges to attend. Further, H.R. 5367 authorizes the Chief Judge of the Superior Court or the Court of Appeals to delay or toll various deadlines in the event of a natural disaster terrorist attack or other related emergency situations. Additionally, under Section 2 of the bill, the D.C. Courts would be authorized to enter into reimbursable agreements for services provided to the District of Columbia, which will help promote efficiency and ensure the proper allocation of resources. And lastly, H.R. 5367 would allow the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia to purchase out of their existing salaries and expense accounts professional liability insurance for its attorneys, staff, and board members, which is already standard practice among other federal public defenders in accordance with the Federal Crim Criminal Justice Act. I understand that all of these provisions have been properly vetted by the majority and minority, and I hope that all the underlying bill sections will be supported by 
our members of this subcommittee given its intent to improve the administration of justice in our nation's capital. I now yield to the ranking member for any opening comments on the bill that he may have. The chair now recognizes ranking member Mr. Chaffetz from Utah for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lynch. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, the bringing this for markup and the, the good work uh, that Delegate Norton has put uh, into this. I appreciate you both for, for introducing this. It's not very often that Congress gets a request for legislation from a government entity that would actually save the taxpayers' money. But that happy prospect has been presented to us by the D.C. courts in, the pl in this piece of legislation. By granting authority to have its judicial conference every other year as opposed to every year, the local courts would save us money. I commend them for seeking dis uh, discretion to move in that direction. Another section of the bill relating to the courts is a bit uh, discomforting but clearly necessary. We all know that the nation's capital remains a main target for terrorists. It is thus unfortunately appropriate to consider how our judicial branch would further function in the event of a major attack or emergency situation, whether a natural disaster or maliciously contrived. Local courts must have the flexibility to function under such circumstances as provided for in this legislation. The District of Columbia Public Defender Service is not now a part of the D.C. government, having been removed from the financial control of the district. Clearly, there should be no doubt that attorneys there should be covered by liability insurance, as all others are. The provision in this legislation removes any ambiguity by providing explicit authority to the Public Defender Service to, service to purchase liability insurance for the public defenders. I therefore support the legislation at this time. Again, I appreciate it being brought up, and I yield uh, all of our colleagues to vote in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair right now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, the lead sponsor of this measure, uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to associate myself with your remarks and with the remarks of the ranking member. Uh, you're right that here the courts have look closely at themselves and come forward with not only cost-saving measures, but measures that will enhance their efficiency. This is here, of course, because uh, certain state functions were turned over to the federal government uh, and therefore are, are, must come before this committee. But at the same time, uh, I must say that, that they are um, uh, almost trivial uh, when measured against what's on the table in Congress, but of, of great importance. Uh, to the courts and to the public defender service, and that's why I so appreciate your treating them, both of you, uh, with such um, seriousness. Uh, I, I, I do want to say that the notion about the annual judicial conference, I, you know, the notion of why don't we do something about something that we're doing by rote, and, and we might want to have it every two years. We might not have anything to say this year. I mean, that's the kind of thing I like to see government do uh, more often. One part of, the, of this bill is really important, and that's the part that allows uh, the courts to toll or delay uh, any statute or rule in the event of a natural or terrorist disaster, and we don't have many Katrinas here, but we are a primary target. Uh, you can close the federal government uh, for a snow. I don't know what they did during the snow. Uh, or what they did I about, uh, about uh, statutes uh, of limitation if they came upon them. But we certainly know that the, in the event of a terrorist disaster, it, it could really dislocate the courts. And somebody has to be able, chief judge, to invoke a measure that says time stops, time out. I so commend you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this forward now and taking that issue uh, off the table for the first time since 9-11. Mr. Chairman, there's another section that I understand you wanted to look at closely. I certainly respect that. I think it is also a cost-saving uh, section, which it would allow these courts, Article I federal courts, to do what other courts can do and what the federal government can do, and that is to engage in voluntary, and I, with an emphasis on voluntary, um, separation or, bu or buyouts. We've been doing it ever since I've been in Congress. In this climate, the courts are doing the responsible thing by coming forward and asking for this authority instead of perhaps having to lay off employees. Um, Mr. Chairman, there are a number of other sections here, but you have gone through those sections, uh, I think, with, with a, a great clarity. I would only mention the public defender section of this bill. 
uh, that I was amazed to find that they have gone without liability insurance since they were turned over to the federal government. That is a very dangerous thing to do. They represent defendants uh, in all manner of matters, and this is a very litigious society. We need to get them the authority out of their own funds to get the necessary liability insurance, and your bill uh, will make it, uh, your, the bill that we've put forward today will make it very clear that they can go ahead. I thank you very much, and I thank the ranking member. I thank the gentlelady. Any other members wish to be heard on this matter? Hearing none, I now ask the clerk to call up H.R. 5367. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 5367, a bill to amend Title 11, District of Columbia Official Code, to revise certain administrative authorities of the District of Columbia Courts, and to authorize the District of Columbia Public Defender Service to provide professional liability insurance for officers and employees of the service for claims relating to services furnished within the scope of employment with the service. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. I believe I have a manager's amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5367 offered by Mr. Lynch. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read without objection. The amendment is considered as read and I now recognize myself for five minutes to speak on this amendment. In short, my amendment makes a minor technical clarification to the provisions of the bill granting the various chief judges the authority to toll or delay court proceedings in the event of an emergency. Additionally, the amendment would add definitions to the base bill for the terms natural disaster and, quote, other emergency situation, close quote. Lastly, the amendment would strike Section 2C of the original bill, which deals with the authorization for the courts to create a voluntary separation incentive program or early out. Uh, while I wouldn't rule out this language being added back into the bill at some future point in the process, I think we simply need additional time uh, and, and additional information, not only for how it would work within this bill, but how some of the other processes work uh, for existing uh, courts and the possible number of impacted employees uh, before I feel comfortable with proceeding with that language. Uh, in closing, I hope that all members will join me in supporting this amendment, and I now yield to the ranking member for five minutes for any comments he may have on the amendment. The gentleman from Utah is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to simply say that we support the amendment and really truly appreciate uh, you working with us, including the staff, and, and working together in a bipartisan way. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Any other members wish to be heard on the amendment? If no other member wishes to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the Lynch Amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. I know, now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia report H.R. 5367 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 5367 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to, and H.R. 5367, as amended, is ordered, reported to the government, excuse me, on the Committee on Government Ref Oversight and Government Reform. The final order of business will be on the consideration of H.R. 5368, the United States Postal Service Postal Inspectors Equity Act. To begin, I introduce this legislation to simply clarify current law with respect to law enforcement availability pay for postal inspectors of the United States Postal Inspection Service. H.R. 5368 will ensure that postal inspectors receive identical compensation to their criminal investigator counterparts at other executive branch agencies. Postal inspectors are law enforcement uh, officials within the Postal Service. 
They protect the United States Postal Service, its employees, and its customers from criminal attack and protect the nation's mail system from criminal misuse. Since the September 11, 2001 attacks, postal inspectors have also investigated cases where anthrax and other toxic substances were sent through the mail. With such demanding law enforcement careers, it's imperative that we treat them just as we would every other federal law enforcement officer. Under current law, compensation for postal inspectors is required to be, quote, comparable, close quote, to criminal investigators of other executive branch agencies. Right now, the Postal Service is paying its postal inspectors law enforcement availability pay, but such payments are not required by statute. As written, the bill will codify the status quo and guarantee that postal inspectors law enforcement availability pay will be preserved and protected. In its current form, H.R. 5368 is admittedly not perfect. We still need to work through some measures, such as the feasibility of making this bill retroactive and extending it to special agents in the Postal Service's Office of the Inspector General. However, this is an important bill, and I'm confident that we can expeditiously work through those minor issues to ensure that the Postal Inspection Service will be able to recruit and retain highly qualified postal inspectors and that parity exists among similar occupations. I believe that this is important that we act on the bill today as a first step towards placing postal inspectors on a level playing field with other federal law enforcement officers. I urge members to support this bill, and I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, for his comments. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 5368 represents a significant shift in the treatment of and policy towards postal inspectors. When the Federal Law Enforcement Pay Reform Act, easily known as FLEPA, <laughs> I love the acronyms. The FLEPA, FLEPA, I don't know how you say that, mm -hmm. FLEPA was passed in 1990. At the request of the Postal Service, postal inspectors were not included in the FLEPA. In 1994, FLEPA was amended by the Law Enforcement Availability Pay Act, or LEAP. At least they've got a good acronym, LEAP. Again, postal inspectors were not included in LEAP. In 1996, rather than extend LEAP coverage to postal inspectors, Congress passed 39 U.S. Code Section 1003C to raise the salaries and benefits paid to postal inspectors to correspond with the compensation for investigators from other federal agencies. In accordance with this section, the Postal Service provided postal inspectors with LEAP pay an additional 25 percent of their basic pay. Today, four days after the introduction of H.R. 5368, without the benefit of a hearing, we are asked to vote to take away the leeway granted to the Postal Service in 1996 and bind them to a law they previously opposed. I must ask myself why we are rushing to take these actions. The obvious conclusion I have reached is that the bill is in response to pending litigation as to the Postal Inspector's entitlement to overtime. I am informed by the United States Postal Service opposes this bill and that the Postal Service believes the passage of this bill would be used in pending lit litigation as evidence that Congress intended postal inspectors to qualify for leap, leap pay and overtime. I cannot support this apparent attempt to intervene in the pending litigation and I urge my colleagues to join me in opposition to this bill. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I say to the ranking member, I don't see the harm done if they're doing it anyway. But I do see some harm done in not doing it by statute. Uh, the, the extraordinary, ins uh, the postal inspectors do extraordinary um, criminal uh, justice work. Uh, you often hear that there is some postal uh, violation that gets us into uh, major uh, criminal matters in, in the first place. The problem with unequal treatment uh, from the point of view of, of, of a, an employee, even though in fact, to their credit, the Postal Service has done it, is uh, unequal treatment across um, federal boundaries of people doing the same work uh, leads to people jumping ship and to instability in the workforce. If these people are doing the same work, uh, if in fact uh, you're training them to do that work, it does no good to have them then go someplace where statute 
uh, uh, by statute, they are granted um, the the uh, inf uh, the law enforcement availability pay. So, I think this is a good thing to do. Only when you're only codifying things, it, I find it hard to understand the basis for disagreement. I appreciate this uh, bill, uh, HR five three six eight, and very much um, support its passage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the general lady. Does the gentleman from Virginia wish to be heard on this? No? Okay. Uh, just in, in, I appreciate the concerns that have been raised by the ranking member on this. There, there is a pending lawsuit uh, between the postal inspectors and the United States Postal Service. Um, there is a legitimate concern on the part of the United States Postal Service that, uh, depending on the direction and the language in this bill, uh, it, it could, if, if not carefully provided for, uh, it could provide a windfall to the uh, postal inspectors. And that is not the intention. Uh, we have agreed within committee to meet with the uh, Postal Service and we have asked them to draft uh, language on retroactivity and an application of this uh, to prevent the possibility that they may be unfairly damaged uh, you know, financially and that a windfall might accrue to one of the parties. The lawsuit is an open question, so uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, we don't inadvertently uh, provide for some level of unfairness here uh, and, and require the Postal Service to, to pay more uh, than, than what should be fairly asked. Uh, going forward and, and that they shouldn't be uh, whipsawed by our decision uh, in, that, in that case. So we're, we are trying our best and, and I'm waiting for language from the Postal Service to include here so that we can move forward. I don't think the postal inspectors are looking for unfair advantage and I, I think what they're looking for is just uniformity and I think they may uh, I, I don't want to speak for any of the parties in that lawsuit, but I, I think going forward, I think we have some compromised language that would secure the rights and, and financial position of the taxpayer and the, you know, uh, the people who use the Postal Service, uh, the United States Postal Service itself, the employees. I think we can find a, a compromised position where uh, no, one, no one is unduly harmed no one is overly uh, advantaged, but we attain the uniformity that we're desiring for the positions of these uh, postal inspectors who right now are being treated differently than everybody else in that, in that area right now. So uh, we'll continue to work with the ranking member and the, uh, our minority members, uh, and uh, I think there's, there's a solution out there, and uh, I am committed to to finding that and making sure that it, it is satisfactory to, to all the parties who are interested in this. And I yield back. Do any other members wish to be heard on this? If no other members wish to speak, and I'll call up H.R. 5368, the clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 5368, a bill to amend title fi titles 5 and 39 of the United States Code to make postal inspectors eligible for availability pay for criminal investigators. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point without objection so ordered. Are there any further amendments? If no members wish to offer an amendment, the, the chair recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just moved to st strike the last word. Just. Uh, I, I think it's premature to try to move this bill so swiftly forward. I appreciate the spirit and the comments that you just made. I concur with those, uh, with those comments that you made. This bill was introduced days ago. I don't think we've adequately heard from the Postal Service. There is obviously a dispute. There is no doubt, as Delega, Delegate Norton pointed out, there's no doubt about the great work uh, that these men and women provide and the difficult circumstances uh, in which they provide these, these services. But I don't want to just be in the mode of swiftly moving something through and pushing it through uh, without hearing all the parties, without having the additional language, knowing that there's a, a lawsuit out there. 
I, 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 I want to be more cautious in not sending, in sending the wrong messages. I, I think we have a duty and role and responsibility to take our time on these types of issues. It hasn't even been a week. So um, I, I, again, will voice some opposition to this. Uh, I know that there are issues that we can address and help solve, but with so many outstanding questions, I would just urge us to take our time a little bit. If we refer this up to the, the committee, we take away our opportunity in the subcommittee to actually have a hearing or hear or, or, or take appropriate action. Uh, I just don't see the, the urgent need to move this to the next level uh, until we've had a time to adequately do our work in this subcommittee. That's what our colleagues expect of us. There are very few of us that show up to these meetings, but I think they expect that we do the due diligence, and, and I don't feel that we've come to that point. This is one of the few bills that, that I think most of the other ones are, have always been very well thought out, but I think this one is a little pr premature with all due respect. Yield back. Well, I, I appreciate the ranking member's concerns. Um, I, I must say, though, that uh, the assurances that, that I've given here are uh, equally applicable at the full committee level. And uh, we are looking uh, for uh, a solution here that the gentleman would be uh, pleased with and, 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 uh, and I think satisfied with um, and honestly I think that the look Congress has never been accused of moving too fast on anything but uh, this, this may be this may be new uh, I, I think that there there is language already out there that we've looked at that seems to be um, uh, in agreement. I think the urgency might be that there is this lawsuit out there and if there were some type of uh, resolution on behalf of one of the parties it may preclude us getting to this point. But while that lawsuit is still an open question I think that the parties might be willing to sort of settle on this and it would make that all go away and uh, and so I think everyone would would be in a better place, uh, in, including the ratepayers uh, of the United States Postal Service. So you know I I would just agree with the member on on trying to to delay this, um, and I can only uh, give him my word and my assurances that uh, that he will be happy with the result. Otherwise, this will not proceed. I always love it that you. You want me to be happy. Okay. All right. Uh, or at least content, if not, if not outright happy. Go Celtics. Do I need to say that? I'll yeah, there you go. go. Okay. All right. If, uh, if no members uh, wish to offer further amendments, I now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia report H.R. 5368 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on, is on favorably reporting H.R. 5368 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The motion is agreed to and H.R. 5368 is ordered reported to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. I believe this. If any members have further statements on any of the matters that have come before the committee this day? Uh, this concludes our business for today. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered reported without objection so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.